So hello everyone, it's really an absolute pleasure to speak at uh, CodeMesh and I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts about this work that I'm going to present now. Uh, also, let me warn you that I will have some questions for you at the end of my talk, so you better pay attention. So some of you uh, may have heard of the dream of classical program synthesis, which actually goes back to the 1950s, like many other computer science problems uh, uh, that was actually posed by Church uh, in, in sur about circuit synthesis and can best be understood as an aspiration to generate programs from what uh, Manna and Waldinger in the 1970s like to call dreams. Okay? Uh, but uh, it's not as simple as that because in reality, what is expected in classical program synthesis from the user is that the user dream up uh, complete formal specifications of their desired program's expected behavior, right? Uh, which for instance, uh, in, in this example for computing the maximum of three integers uh, could uh, very well look like this, right? Uh, this logical formula over here. Now, uh, I'm pretty confident that many of you who are watching this talk may indeed be able to dream up or whip up uh, this lovely specification in a jiffy, but uh, the average human or even the average programming enthusiast uh, may not, right? And uh, there is always this uh, debate in, um, in classical program synthesis about whether it's actually easier to uh, come up with the specification uh, than to write up the program itself, right? So inductive program synthesis, which is, some, which is what I want to talk about today, uh, and in particular, it's programming by examples or PBE variant, uh, seeks to address the specification problem in classical uh, program synthesis and also more ambitiously democratize uh, programming by only asking users to provide examples of their expected input output behavior. Okay, so for our max problem here, uh, our user could just simply say that when the inputs are uh, 0, 10, and 2, uh, the output should be 10, and so on, right? So hopefully you will agree that this task is certainly easier than writing down the program itself, right? Um, and, and in fact can be done by non-expert users who may not be able to or willing to write complete formal specifications. So I want to uh, just say that in case you think inductive program synthesis is a much more uh, modern paradigm of uh, program synthesis than what Manna and Waldinger imagined back in the 1970s, um, I just want to uh, point you to these papers that I uh, dug up from the 1970s. There were many more on synthesizing list programs from examples. Okay, so, so this does go uh, way back. <clears throat> I want to make uh, one more point. Uh, uh, not only does the specification problem get easier with inductive synthesis, but if you just consider the synthesis task itself, right, it becomes significantly more tractable, more automatable, more scalable uh, when the problem is to find a program that is consistent with just a small set of finite uh, examples, as opposed to the problem of finding a program that is uh, consistent with a logical specification over a possibly infinite input domain, right? In fact, this difference in tractability is so obvious and so significant that the most popular solution strategy for the classical synthesis problem is actually based on using an inductive uh, synthesis engine within the target synthesizer. In, in, in particular, in an active learning-like setup with a, a verification engine or some other oracle acting as the teacher and the inductive synth synthesis engine acting as a learner. Okay, so as the learner or the inductive synthesis engine comes up with some uh, solutions, uh, some programs, the Oracle can uh, inspect the solution and the program and give some feedback back to the uh, inductive synthesis engine in the form of some interesting examples, like for instance, counter examples or negative in, uh, examples if the Oracle is a verification engine and help it refine its solution, help the learner refine its solution. So this is a very, uh, re, uh, very popular solution strategy for uh, uh, classical program synthesis. It's called Oracle Guided Inductive Synthesis and its most popular instantiation is counter example guided inductive synthesis uh, where the Oracle is the verification engine and, and the feedback is in the form of counter examples. So this is uh, one of the uh, coolest and most impactful ideas in program synthesis in the recent decades. 
And I just wanted to uh, include this paper uh, from 2006 by Armando Solar Lezama, uh, which introduced this idea along with some other uh, very important uh, program synthesis ideas. Uh, I will come back to this uh, later in the talk. So uh, in more recent inductive program synthesis approaches, uh, we primarily view this as a search problem. So what do I mean by this? Well, uh, we allow the synthesizer to additionally accept a syntactic template of the space of possible programs in the form of a grammar or a domain specific language or what is called a partial program or sketch or uh, essentially an incomplete program with holes. Okay, so given this program space, we can then view this uh, synthesis problem as a search problem to find a program in the program space that is consistent uh, with the given set of examples. Okay, so uh, this formulation, uh, which is representative of the modern era of inductive synthesis, was put forth in a 2011 paper by uh, Sumit Gulwani. And uh, this is also one of the uh, most impactful papers uh, in program synthesis. Uh, which ushered in really uh, a lot of uh, research in program synthesis. Uh, also, this paper led to the development of flash fill. I'm not sure if you are uh, uh, familiar with that, but if you use Microsoft Excel, then you are actually using flash fill. So flash fill can actually detect patterns um, as a user types of uh, data and under the hood, synthesize a little program to help uh, the user complete the rest of the entries. So basically it just automates the completion of the rest of the in entries by synthesizing a program that learns from examples. So even now to date, uh, flash fill is actually the best success story of inductive synthesis, okay? Because it has actually been adopted uh, in uh, industry and in Microsoft Excel. So before I move on, I, I want to clarify that inductive synthesis can mean many things to many people. Uh, but in this talk, when I say inductive synthesis or inductive program synthesis, I'm essentially referring to exactly this uh, search-based programming by example variant, okay? So let's uh, move on. Uh, you have probably realized uh, that inductive program synthesis sounds very similar to inductive learning, where the goal is essentially to learn a general function or rule uh, from uh, specific input output pairs in a hypothesis space. And, and when you view um, this uh, inductive learning setup uh, as, as I have illustrated here, then it is easy to see how inductive program synthesis is simply an instance of inductive learning where uh, the input output uh, pairs are essentially input output examples. The hypothesis space is replaced by the program space and the output uh, the learned function is, is essentially a program, uh, a structured program in the program space, right? But uh, yeah, even though they are similar, there are of course some differences uh, because in, in inductive program synthesis, the examples are provided by a user and hence are a small handful in contrast to the large uh, training data sets that are common in inductive learning, right? Also programs are far more structured, more interpretable, more explainable. Um, than their counterparts in inductive learning. But uh, this, despite these differences, inductive program synthesis inherits, uh, inherits almost all of the complications, the big challenges of inductive learning, which are uh, ambiguity, overfitting, and, and brittleness. And um, let's see uh, what these actually mean in our context, in the context of inductive program synthesis. So ambiguity here means that there can be a large number of programs that are consistent uh, with a set of examples. Uh, and obviously not all of these programs expect, uh, exhibit the implicit intended behavior on unseen inputs because they might overfit to the examples and fail to generalize to unseen inputs, right? So I don't know, in case you're curious, uh, let me just say that this bottom program is wrong because it doesn't correctly handle the case when y is less than z is less than x, which is not included in these examples, okay? When y is less than z, uh, then this uh, m, which is supposed to be the return value, uh, is set to z, overwriting the value of m, um, uh, assignment to m of x. So the, the answer is going to be z instead of x, okay? When y is less than z is less than x. 
So this is a classic example of uh, overfitting and the synthesizer can potentially output this incorrect program uh, that is consistent with the examples, but is incorrect, right? Uh, to illustrate what brittleness means, uh, this is a slightly more subtle thing. Uh, let's take this uh, scenario we have been looking at and focus on this last IO example, right? Now, if we just swap these last two inputs, so you swap negative two and negative three, you just swap their order, then we have an instance of the synthesizer switching from an incorrect uh, program to the correct program, okay? Uh, which is essentially a program that is semantically quite different from the original program, right? So a small perturbation in the input, which is actually, a, which doesn't really change the semantics of the input, results in programs that are uh, semantically uh, divergent, right? And uh, I just wanted to mention a fun fact, by the way. Uh, so I, this is not a made up example. I found this witness to brittleness while playing around uh, with a synthesizer. And uh, this witness is how, uh, what shaped how I think about inductive program synthesis now. So going back to these problems, uh, because how do we deal, deal with them? I mean, because we've inherited these problems from inductive learning, it makes sense to actually uh, learn and adapt from the solutions uh, that uh, uh, inductive learning uses to combat these problems, right? And, and so what does inductive uh, learning do? Well, uh, uh, inductive bias, of course, right? Which is essentially a set of assumptions made by a learning algorithm in order to perform induction, which is this task of generalization from a finite set of observations to uh, a general uh, ru uh, rule or a function over the entire domain, right? A common uh, inductive bias uh, uh, used in inductive learning, for instance, is Occam's razor, which says, uh, which assumes that the simplest uh, hypothesis that is consistent with the examples is typically the best and, and guides uh, the learning algorithm accordingly, okay? So yes, the, in the case of inductive program synthesis as well, uh, there, are, uh, there are lots of attempts to apply inductive biases, okay? Uh, but what is common to almost all of the uh, work that is done in this space of inductive bias for inductive program synthesis is essentially uh, along the lines of applying a syntactic bias, okay? So uh, one could uh, use Occam's razor in this context, which essentially corresponds to uh, steering the search towards the smallest program, or uh, one could design some highly uh, structured DSLs that really uh, syntactically restrict the space of programs, or one could uh, use, uh, one uses uh, ranking functions or neural guided search heuristics, which are also uh, typically and mainly based on syntactic features of programs, okay? So, so these ha have worked great. I mean, these have made inductive program synthesis uh, more effective and have uh, enabled us to get more ambitious about the possibilities uh, with inductive synthesis. But still, unfortunately, overall, the ambiguity, brittleness, uh, and overfitting problems are far from solved, okay? So uh, the question, if I were actually interacting with you all right now, that I would ask is, What's the next big idea? What's the next big idea for generalizable and robust inductive synthesis? Okay, and uh, here's my answer in brief. Let's incorporate more and more and more semantics into this process, okay? And others have also noted the significance of semantic bias. So there have been some efforts uh, that have been largely sporadic uh, to apply semantic biases to the search space as well in the form of types, um, and, and uh, inverse uh, semantics of DSL operators, uh, all, and also some other notions of semantics that are somewhat weak uh, with or without a user, right? But overall, uh, the opportunities, theories, and techniques for semantically biasing a search space really remain relatively unexplored. Uh, semantic biases are certainly not the first thing that come to mind when one is designing uh, or developing an inductive synthesis engine. So this finally leads me to the focus of our work and, uh, and the topic of uh, this talk, uh, which is our Mantis project on uh, semantics guided inductive synthesis. And many of the ideas in this project have been in the works for several years now. Okay, some of our initial ideas were in the space of inductive program repair in this CAF 2016 paper on close 
and in this PLDI 2019 paper on same cluster. Uh, now, why inductive program repair? Well, because it can actually uh, be viewed as a synthesis problem. It is a synthesis problem. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail to explain why, uh, because of lack of time, but I just want to say that program, the inductive bias applied in inductive program repair is in the form of minimizing uh, the distance between the repaired program and the original program. Okay, so one needs to think about program distances uh, in program repair. And uh, in these two papers, we defined and uh, showed the effectiveness of using uh, notions of program distance that are based on semantic features of uh, programs. Okay, so that's all I'm going to tell you right now, but feel free to ask me more uh, later. What I do want to spend more, more of the remaining time on is our work on uh, semantics guided uh, program synthesis. Okay, so let me uh, start with the ideas in our Popple paper from earlier this uh, year on, on Sketch AX. So let's again go back to this uh, problem with ambiguity, right, that we saw earlier, where there can be many programs that are consistent with the examples, but only some of them uh, exhibit uh, or generalize to unseen inputs, right? Now, suppose in this max example, an oracle tells us that the program is permutation invariant that the program you are trying to learn is permutation invariant, okay? Which means that the program output does not change when the elements of the program input are permuted. So it turns out in this example, this additional knowledge is enough to eliminate this incorrect program and steer the search to a correct program, okay? Um, this is a relational property and it's clearly an instance of applying a semantic bias to the search space. But the question remains, how do we apply this bias, right? How to bias the program space towards permutation invariant programs? Now, uh, we could obviously ask uh, an oracle to write up a logical formula that encodes permutation invariance and then ask the synthesizer to enforce this constraint if it can do so. But this would defeat uh, the tractability arguments we made earlier for inductive synthesis, wouldn't it? So, we need to try to apply this bias efficiently using some partial uh, specification of uh, permutation inv invariance and not a complete formal specification, right? To, uh, to stay in the spirit of inductive synthesis. So here's a clever idea, okay? Uh, why not apply this property to the given user provided examples by permuting the inputs and keeping the output unchanged thereby generating additional examples for the synthesizer, okay? So this, you can see that this actually has the intended effect of placing a semantic bias on the search space, right? Uh, so this is great, but uh, can we apply uh, the permutation invariance? Uh, so we can apply the permutation invariance bias in this way, but can we do this for other kinds of relational properties? The answer is yes. Uh, so we have identified a class of properties uh, which includes uh, permutation invariance, but also includes uh, many other properties that I'll just take you through uh, in, in a second uh, that we call relational perturbation properties, which essentially relate the change in the program output to the change in the program input. So uh, permutation preservation, for instance, says that if you permute the inputs in a certain way, then the output is permuted in the same way uh, value invariance says that if you apply an affine transformation to the input, then the output remains unchanged. Or in the case of value preservation, the output is transformed used by the same affine transformation and so on. Really, there is, we have a general formulation for these properties that encapsulates an infinite class of properties. Uh, I'll point you to our Popper paper for that. But what I want to emphasize is that because of the way we define these properties, we can apply this uh, clever strategy we just saw to uh, any relational perturbation properties, okay? Because we can just take a user provided set of examples and apply uh, the property to obtain a larger set of examples uh, that include the perturbed examples, right? So we can actually have a very simple two-step strategy to uh, synthesize uh, programs uh, by semantically biasing the search space using uh, relational perturbation properties, okay? In the first step, we uh, perturb the examples, we augment the examples by applying these relational perturbation properties. 
And then in the second step, we just use an existing synthesizer uh, to generate a program from this augmented set of examples. Okay. Uh, yeah, fairly simple, but uh, hopefully you are thinking about uh, the, this question, where do the properties come from? Who provides the properties, right? And so let me just show you three different UIs, user interfaces with varying degrees of user involvement uh, to answer this question. So uh, from now on, uh, I'm just, I'm going to use this uh, green engine here to denote our new synthesizer, which is built on top of an inductive uh, synthesis engine, something that we have been seeing all along. And I also want to uh, get rid of this program space in all slides from now on, because you know, uh, it's always there. And uh, briefly, uh, I want you to permit me to get rid of the initial examples that the user has to provide in all the three uh, user interfaces I can show you. So we can focus on the additional information the user needs to provide in each case, okay? So here are the three different user interfaces. The first is the property selection user interface where the, users, the user herself uh, selects a set of applicable properties from a finite set of properties, okay? So for this max problem, the user might say, uh, uh, it satisfies permutation invariance, it satisfies value preservation, and so on, okay? So the, obviously the burden on the user in this UI is, is big, uh, but, but we lessen this burden in the next user interface where uh, the user is just asked to validate or invalidate uh, some uh, perturbed examples that are generated by applying the property to the original examples, okay? So if the user um, validates all the perturbed examples that she sees, then the synthesizer, then the green synthesizer just assumes uh, that the property holds and, and, and can proceed, okay? So that's the property validation UI. And then finally, this is the coolest UI uh, because it looks exactly like the standard programming by example setup we have been seeing so far, where the user has to do nothing beyond providing the input output examples, the initial ones. And uh, the green synthesis engine actually automatically infers applicable properties. Okay, so these are our three different UIs. And now let's see what work needs to be done by this green synthesizer in each case. So for property selection, uh, because the user does most of the work, the synthesizer doesn't have to do a lot. Uh, for each user provided property, our engines simply implements our key strategy. It applies the property to perturb the examples uh, and then simply uses the existing synthesizer to synthesize a program from this resulting augmented set of examples, okay? Uh, because this will, it will be handy, let me just package all of this into this purple uh, perturbation engine, okay? Let's move on to the next UI where the user has to do less. And so the green synthesis engine has to do just a little bit more. I mean, it has to actually uh, generate properties and engage with the user in this feedback loop uh, until it is confident that the user has validated uh, the property by validating its perturbed examples. But once that's done, then uh, the synthesizer can just proceed as before, as, as the previous UI, right? with the perturbation engine and uh, this uh, black box synthesizer. Uh, in the final and this, this, this coolest UI, uh, our uh, green uh, synthesizer obviously needs to do the most work because it seeks to infer properties that are consistent with the uh, synthesis problem at hand. And while it's at it, why not uh, try to seek the maximal set of properties that is consistent with the uh, synthesis problem at hand. So again, I do not have time to go into this, but for those of you who uh, uh, might know about this, I, I'm just gonna tell you that a property inference engine is basically based on the idea of encoding this uh, problem of finding a maximal set of applicable properties as a maximum satisfiability problem that can be handled uh, by uh, many, max, uh, many SMT solvers, okay? So, but I'm just going to, you know, uh, package all of that into this white box and pop it into this pipeline that we now have, okay? So you infer the properties, then you perturb and generate more examples and use an existing synthesizer just as a black box. 
so how does uh, how does all of this uh, do in practice okay so we eval evaluated our frame framework by specializing it to sketch which is um, which goes back to this paper i've shown you before by armando solar rezama um, where this existing uh, the black box synthesizer inside is essentially a sketch right and we call our synthesis engine sketch ax i know it's not a super imaginative uh, uh, naming but it's sketch with augmented examples so our data set consists of benchmarks drawn from various uh, sketch repositories and also from uh, some tracks of the syntax guided synthesis competition which is held annually uh, the variable domains include scalars uh, arrays and matrices over uh, booleans and integers and the program space is defined using a uh, these partial programs or sketches that i mentioned before which are incomplete programs with holes okay so uh, let me first show you the success rate of the different user interfaces and baseline sketch for benchmarks that actually do satisfy some properties i mean all the benchmarks in our data set do not uh, necessarily have to satisfy properties so how do we compute this success rate well it is computed over 10 runs for each benchmark Uh, with each run using a different randomly generated set of three examples okay and then we have an offline verification engine that can actually check the correctness of the program that is generated okay so you are successful when the program that is generated by the synthesizer is actually correct is actually verified to be correct so uh this gray bar is uh, baseline sketches success rate the purple one is Uh, the success rate of our selection ui the blue one for our validation ui and this green one for our inference ui okay so the first thing i want you to notice is that uh the performance the success rate of the validation ui and the inference ui's uh matches that of the uh, selection ui okay so that this means that our property inference must be working pretty well okay so this is cool and the second thing i want you to notice is that all of our uis of uh, sketch ax provide a 60% improvement uh, in the success rate of baseline sketch okay which is significant and now this improvement becomes more dramatic if we actually focus on bit vector benchmarks uh, with uh, properties where uh, the performance of ske baseline sketch is pretty poor it's 30% and we are able to improve it by 191% okay um now uh let's just take a quick look at su these uh, success rates over different categories of benchmarks so i just want to uh, point you to two things so if you look at benchmarks that do not satisfy any properties we do not really hurt the success rate of baseline sketch which means that our uh, uh inference uh, engine a property inference engine is not uh is not inferring properties negative properties that is not inferring properties that do not hold in most cases okay so uh, property the positive and negative property inference works very well and and lastly our overall improvement over all the benchmarks is 22% so um that was sketch ax and i just want to give you a quick preview uh, on our ongoing work uh, on semantics guided inductive synthesis for a domain that i believe many of you will be interest, interested in uh which is functional programs hence the name sys lambda okay so uh to specialize our idea to this domain we focus on a state of the art art inductive synthesizer lambda squared uh which is at least partly type driven okay See, so it has some uh uh it, it does incorporate semantics in some way unfortunately even in this domain our old problems show up so for instance for this single uh, input output example uh, lambda squared generates this uh uh pretty random uh max prop uh program uh, which works for this example but obviously doesn't compute the max right now uh fortunately our uh, our tactic from before works in this space as well so if we actually apply permutation invariance and augment the examples uh then uh lambda square is able to uh synthesize a correct program okay so this is in very early stages so i don't want to claim too much but in our initial experiments we are already seeing uh, a 26% improve uh, improvement in the success rate over lambda square okay without really trying to optimize anything so this is promising and and we are uh, we look forward to seeing how this work shapes up 
So I'm going to begin to wrap up now, okay, uh, with some cool problems that we can all think about in this space. So let's go back to this uh, pipeline of tasks I had shown you inside the green synthesis engine. Now, there are many opportunities to, advise, uh, to advance uh, this pipeline to many other uh, synthesis domains, right? Like functional programs that you just saw, data wrangling, synthesis of SQL queries, and so on. Uh, by first essentially identifying what are some relevant, interesting relational perturbation properties in that domain, figuring out how to uh, infer or learn with or without a user or using other techniques um, to uh, learn such properties, and then using a perturbation engine with an existing domain-specific uh, synthesizer treated as a black box, just like we did. Okay, so that's something, there is, there is plenty of room to do more here, just using this approach. But if we uh, are a bit more ambitious and if we decide to open up existing synthesizers or design our own synthesizers uh, to incorporate relational perturbation properties within uh, their search algorithms, then really we can do more. This opens up the possibility to consider arbitrary relational properties. We don't have to be tied to relational perturbation properties because you know uh, it's a different problem now. And we can probably incorporate other uh, semantic properties as well. Okay, so this is something that I'm actually very excited about. And finally, uh, it would be very interesting to see if we can learn uh, uh, what I want to think of as probabilistic models of the property or semantic signature of a domain and then use this to guide the search. Okay, so this is similar to a lot of recent work on uh, neural guided synthesis, uh, of course, but uh, most of that work, again, is based on uh, syntactic features of programs. And when they use some semantic features, they are very, very minor and, and weak. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm also very excited about this. So uh, this is my most important slide. All the amazing students and collaborators who have been and continue to be uh, essential to this project. The students are on top. Uh, my collaborators include people from uh, both academia and industry. And I just want to highlight my student Yongwei Yuan and my collaborator Arjun Radhakrishna from Microsoft, uh, who are uh, my current collaborators in this Sys Lambda uh, work. So here is my one slide takeaway for you. If you're thinking about inductive program synthesis, then please think how to incorporate more and more semantics into your solution. Okay, uh, with that, let's move on to the Q&A. And as promised, here are some questions I have for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to read all questions of the session Q&A. Please feel free to add more. I, I'm going to pick, I'm going to ask Dominic Orchard to unmute himself and ask him his, ask his question. Dominic, can you unmute? I don't, I don't have, uh, uh, yeah. I like yeah. it. <clears throat> Sorry, it didn't let me, but now, now it is. Um, so I wondered about using this in a polymorphic setting where you might not be able to actually specify a concrete example. Like I was thinking of the polymorphic function which flips the components of a pair. So can you do something that's a bit more symbolic in that setting? Uh, we perhaps could, I mean, we could, because inductive synthesis doesn't really have to be restricted to just examples. Uh, it can really uh, be used to uh, subsume any synthesis procedure where the specification is partial and not complete, right? So I think that could be done, but there is always this trade-off between the tractability of the synthesis engine and the, uh, you know, the completeness and the expressiveness of the specification language. So that's the thing that we would have to uh, balance if we want to think along those lines. Okay. General, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so it occurred to me whilst listening to your talk that um, unit tests seem to, at least for human programmers, to be inherently easier to write uh, than uh, implementations. Uh, so I wonder if there's any value in adding an extra stage to the pipeline in which you first generate uh, unit tests based on examples and then perhaps use those unit tests to generate more examples that can then be used to generate the uh, the actual implementation of the program. 
I guess I wonder if, if that adds any value or if perhaps uh, you don't get anything extra um, from that intermediate step. Uh, interesting observation. Uh, yeah, I do not see right away what extra value unit tests can uh, provide over the kinds of input output examples we are currently using. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, there are definitely some approaches, by the way, in uh, program synthesis and inductive program synthesis, which uh, phase this process out of synthesis. So they first learn some higher level hypothesis and then try to complete that hypothesis or, you know, uh, refine it further in the next phase and so on. So I think your idea is uh, somewhere along those lines and there might be ways to do that uh, using other things. Thank you. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll be, for, for the last few seconds remaining, uh, I, I, I love seeing Edwin Bader's talk this morning with, with, with Idris and Holes, etc. And I'm wondering, is there any way that these two worlds connect? Can I be in an interactive theorem prover and I type underscore, and there's a choice of possible ways which that role could be filled in? Could I use an approach like this to then? get the program I want by just providing a few examples. Is there a connection to be made there or is that just too different a world? So you are probably talking about proof completion or proof synthesis. And um, I have seen some work in this area, but it's very nascent. Okay. And I've certainly not seen anything that is uh, based on an inductive approach. So mm -hmm. I would say there are some high level ideas that can be, you know, uh, migrated from uh, one to the other. Uh, but as with a, moving from any domain, you really have to think completely differently about what are the requirements, what are the semantics in that domain. Yeah. Right. 